Library Director, and I'd like to welcome you to the John H. Ames Reading Series. We have these every month, so I hope you will come back for future readings as well. As some of you may know and some of you may not know, we are in a major fund drive to in order to uh, keep the Heritage Room activities going and the room itself functioning. We are uh, trying to match a challenge grant of the federal government. For every three dollars we raise, they give us a match with one dollar. So we greatly appreciate contributions. There are forms on the back table with a coffee. If you're so inclined, please pick one up. We can certainly use the money. Now to get down to the real purpose of this evening, which is a reading. I'd like to apologize for the heat. We're having some problems with our uh, heating system, and they're working on it, but they still don't have it under control. Just think of being in a sauna or something like that. Um, this evening, we're very privileged to have with us Marsha Southwick. Marsha teaches in the English department at the University of Nebraska. She formerly taught at the University of Colorado and also at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. She is the former editor of the Missouri Review. Her poems have appeared in such magazines as Poetry, American Poetry Review, and the North American Review. Some of her books are The Night Who Would Say Any Anyone and What's the Trees Go Into. Let us welcome Marsha. Thank you. If you want to sit down, you might be able to sit in here. I don't know. It's sort of uncomfortable back there. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'm going to try to read just under an hour, a psychiatrist hour, they call it. Um, and I'll be, I'm, I'm going to read you a, a bunch of poems from various different points uh, in my writing career. And I'll start by reading some poems I wrote when I was 21 years old, because I noticed there's some students in here. And this might give you some hope looking at these poems, thinking, she wrote like that? Okay. When I was 21, I would come home from college and tell my father, who's a surgeon, that I wanted to be a poet. And my parents just thought this was very, very strange. And they would, you want to be a what? You know, and then my, but my father thought that what I should do with my life was become an operating room nurse. Somehow he had a fantasy that I would go to the operating room with him and pass him the scalpels and stuff. So this is a poem, uh, a kind of fantasy on my part about a discussion that takes place at the breakfast table. And it's called My Vocation. This discussion takes place at the breakfast table. I ask my father what he plans to do today, and he says, operate. He'll enter through the stomach, arrive at the tumor by the intestines, turn around and come back. My brother looks up from a cereal, asks if he can come watch, but my father says no. However, he turns to me, wants to know my plans for the future. There's a great future in becoming an operating room nurse. Then he opens the bag of instruments beside him. They look like wrenches, ice picks, and razor blades. You should become more familiar with these, he says. Right around that same time, my, I had a creative writing teacher. Actually, it was a class in fiction, which I, I tended to severe towards poems more than I did fiction, and she assigned us to write a mystery story. And we were supposed to, as I remember, sort of create the mystery and then write it backwards. Have you ever heard that, that mystery writers do this? They, they get all the clues and so forth and then start with all the knowledge and then work backwards to the point of no knowledge. Well, I did this in 15 lines, and uh, it's called The Player Piano. The door was open, and the cat was hiding in the bushes when the police arrived. The neighbor's little girl was missing, but there were some clues. A piano mover's manual, ropes, no piano, and a parking place big enough for a truck. This is what could have happened. Piano movers rang the doorbell, said they had a piano to deliver. Once it was safely in the hall, they gagged her, tied her up, and stuffed her inside. It was an upright. Then they hauled the piano back to the truck. If anybody asked questions, they were returning it to the shop because the stairs weren't wide enough. If anybody wondered why the piano was playing madly by itself, 
They just said it was a player piano. The next group of poems I'd like to read are all more recent poems, very recent poems, and they're all persona poems or poems written in, the, in another character's voice, something I like to try occasionally. The first one, in the first one, the sun is speaking the poem, and it's called The Sun Speaks. I search for new meaning and find black poplars inaccessible like locked doors, roses turning brown from the inside out, and wind that quickens into an almost material thing as it nudges aside a dry leaf here and there to make room for itself. Shadows shouldn't clutter the yard, but they do. On a larger scale, the landscape is further complicated by a network of roads and sidewalks. The entire pattern, seen from a distance, looks almost life-threatening, like an underground root system. Yet, on the subject of deserts and naked skin, I'm still the expert. Who really belongs here? I don't know. But if the picket fence surrounding your house seems less preoccupied than usual and doesn't hold you in, take a long walk to see the roses again. If the night loses track of you, along with everything else that obliterates, backyards and sheds, for instance, slipping out of existence as the night erases things to perfection. Don't worry, I'll be back to stare down at you from my office of fire. Widower's song, he's addressing his dead wife. I tend to go for the more comic subjects in my poetry, you'll notice. Widower's song. Don't bones matter to you you refuse to take back your skin, refuse to wear the blue dress I love so. You've left, left your purse in the closet. You've left your coat. You won't need it as you walk the new streets of heaven. I'd think of snow, but it's not worth it. Drift after drift keeps me apart from you with walls of white. Rooms surround me, and mirrors make me want to look at myself for the last time. A woman can't make a watch. She can only guess it needs repair. A woman can't find sticks. She can only build a fire. Proverbs meant to hurt you make you walk up the stairs. I've never wanted to see the shadows shed their clothes. I've never wanted to see what's underneath. A dark so dark is easy to love. If snow doesn't touch you and you're protected, sealed off by sky or window, stare down at me through clouds, those indifferent ghosts. This next one is a persona poem about how memory, how emotion can obscure and alter memory to the point where the actual facts of the past are lost altogether or to the point where you really don't know whether they've been lost altogether or not. And it's called The Liar and it's written in a, a girl's voice. I mean, by that I mean 14, 15, something like that. The Liar. Years ago, I hid beneath the porch of our white farmhouse, hoping that someone would notice my absence. For hours I tolerated the ants crawling over my legs because I wanted to hear my parents call out my name in worried voices. Nothing happened. My mother and father sat on the porch above me and talked about setting traps for the mice that invaded the house each spring. Once, I painted a half-black moon beneath my eye. At school, I told a story that changed as the day wore on. I'd fallen from a tree. I'd been chased by my brother with a stick. I'd been slapped in the eye by my mother. Soon the black eye seemed so real to me, I didn't notice the black paint beginning to smudge across my cheek. Of course, no one believed me, but the stories were true and the paint was simply an excuse to tell them. My mother had migraine headaches and used to slap our heads to ease the pain. Sometimes she chased us through the house with a pair of scissors in her hand. Later, when my eyes went bad, I was relieved because I thought the doctors would finally discover my concussions, but my mother wouldn't let them test me. She didn't want anyone to know. Now my mother claims not to remember any of this. Either she's a mad woman or I'm mad and this story is a lie. Maybe it doesn't matter. It only matters that something irrevocable happened causing me to say all of this. This one has two characters talking, and they're two young women in a jail. 
you'll find out why they're in jail in the poem. And the title I took from a story by Gene Stafford, I love this title, it's called Bad Characters. And when I just saw that title, I thought, I'd love to write a conversation of two bad characters. So when I shift voices, I'll just sort of move over like this and move over like this. I don't know how to really do this stuff. I'm not a, I didn't major in drama, unfortunately, in college, so I'll do my best. Bad characters. Papa tapped my shoulder, turned me around, and slapped my face. North of here, the jails are even colder. Remember when we ransacked the vacant houses and stole the kitchen sinks? I remember rats in an empty birdcage. Back then, I was a natural blonde. Were you a natural blonde when you shot Papa? A music box played the blue Danube. Don't you think the soft gray eyes of horses are beautiful in a way? I'd never betray you, not on your life. Papa's horse fucked me twice. My hand stayed clean. The blood-stained shirt, you buried it. I wish we could talk the way they do in Paris, vin rouge. As a kid, you'd put your fingers in your ears, close your eyes like this, and shout, shut up. Papa opened the door, pointed the to the road, and said, only good kids don't get thrown from moving cars. That's just a poem built on hearing voices, just recording what I'm hearing in my head. Uh, oh, that didn't sound right. Sounded a little strange, didn't it? Well, okay. It's not all that serious. This is just the imagination. Um, the next one is I conceived of as a character, although it's not quite as distinct a character as the last few I've read. This one is just a, a person listening to children playing the, the game Red Light, Green Light. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that children's game, but everybody creeps up to the one who's it, and then the one who's it turns around and says Red Light, and then turns the other way and says Green Light, and they creep up further. And as she's listening to that, she's remembering being, as a child, being put into her room. You know, the typical child punishment. Red light, green light. The woods lock them in. Leaves click, shut around them. The children playing, red light, green light. What should I do? A few words drifting through my window are loud enough to halt the children's voices which vanish like snuffed out stars. Pushing me back in, holding the door ajar, she said, stay here, here. Don't move, there's an overflow of woods, or sprouting from a crack in the floor, the light and four walls sealing me in. She shoved me back into my body, a door slamming, there, remember this. It's the way the wind stops, and the children playing red light, green light, scatter for forward. The one who's it says red light, her voice a sliver of white ice ringing the air. Next I'll read a, a few poems from my book and I won't save anyone. Uh, many of these poems take place is the landscape they center upon is in Connecticut where the Connecticut River meets the shoreline in a town called Old Lyme. Now if you've never been to the East Coast, what many of you probably have, it's one of those New England towns that's where, you know, it's little white houses and you, and all the men wear pink uh, sweaters and green slacks and they play golf. That's kind of what it's like. Um, I had to, at one point I published a chapbook called Connecticut Eight Poems and the editor asked me to write an essay on what Connecticut meant to me. And I sat down and I kept writing all these mushy things about Connecticut. And finally it occurred to me to write about the town, uh, uh, Old Lyme, where I spent a lot of time as an adolescent. So here's a little essay, very short, just a couple of paragraphs that'll kind of give you a, a vantage point by which to look at the rest of the poems, the next three or four poems anyway. When I think of Connecticut, I think of the small towns Towns too small to have medical examiners. I spent much of my adolescence in such a place, and what impressed me most was the way the people who surrounded me seemed utterly and strangely civilized. That is, they all had perfect but modest weddings at the small white congregational church at the center of town, and they were all offended by the same things. The motorcyclists, for example, who would sometimes ride through town and disturb the quiet and yet beneath the decor was another life, a secret life, 
There were stories of inbreedings and of children starved in attics of white houses with green shutters. Only occasionally would the tragedy of the secret life surface. Otherwise, everyone went on as usual, talking about the rug thief who ransacked the town, stealing only oriental rugs, or about the fact that there was, as I said before, no medical examiner, which sometimes presented a problem. Once, for example, when a man collapsed dead on the tennis court, no one could move him until the medical examiner came from the next town. And the odd thing is, one had the feeling that everyone was sorry, but also that they wanted to get on with their game. Uh, my parents live on this beautiful marshland area in Connecticut, and one of my mother's acquaintances decided she liked that area so much that when her husband died, she wanted to take his ashes and cast them out over the marshland. And my mother said yes, but the truth was she was sort of angry about it because it meant that this woman would be visiting a lot, and she did not really like this acquaintance very much. Well, so she was angry at the woman until I wrote the poem, Now She's Angry at Me, and it's taking care of her relationship with the woman. It's fine, but she's mad at me, so not really. Owning a Dead Man. The geese fly off, but sometimes they don't take their voices with them. Stretched out like this, I think my future is simple, like a cornfield filling with light. I'm happy because of the way the geese have left their shadows drying on the lawn around me, and the way the long docks lean out into the water, letting the unpainted boats knock against them. Once, my mother told me, a woman came to this place with an urn that held her dead husband's ashes. The woman's pale hands tossed bits of gray-white bone and soot onto the marsh where the quail hid. My mother was angry that the bones had trespassed her land. In a way, she said, I own a dead man. Now as I lie here, I think of the coming winter, of his bones mixed with the bones of the mouth and the gull, cleansed and shining in the new snow. But if I try to think too deeply, it's as if a bird were pulling straws from a dried-out nest. So I wonder if I have ever witnessed the middle of winter, the birch tree's inability to lose anything more, or if I've ever seen myself as more irrelevant than in December. In that cold and stillness, my blood and my muscles contracting as I tramp through the snow couldn't possibly mean anything. And there are days when a landscape feels nothing for its real trees, only for what lies still in the snow, or only for what has been. The um, sort of consciousness in this book seems to be a consciousness slightly other than mine or one aspect of mine. And it's kind of interesting because the character in, in these poems that I'm reading, they, you know, she's an observer and she has a tendency to read significance into all objects of nature. And the funny thing is that in real life I can't even keep a house plan alive. So I don't know, this must be some sort of dreamlike part of myself. Okay, this is called Winter Gulls. At first I narrow my eyes because I think that maybe the gulls want more from me than simply my observation of them. But then I realize I'm mistaken. It's just that they're usually thought of as beautiful, while to me they look like scraps of dirty cloth as they flap about over a dead fish left on the dock. On another day, I might have exorcised them more easily from my mind, or I might have walked out to the wet rocks and thought again of all the years the rocks and the tide have stayed unmoved by each other. But today, it's as if the grass doesn't want to be disturbed by anyone walking too quickly. So I stay in one place and keep staring at the gulls reeling over the fish. And I think of myself as elsewhere, how around me there are always other people, and to them I am always there, but never here. It seems to me that this is a tragedy, like losing a best friend, so everyone keeps talking nevertheless or calling to each other over what they think is the not too serious distance between them. But sometimes, like now, I can feel that distance becoming acute. It's as if I were asleep and trying to open my mouth.
Here's a poem from my new manuscript, very similar in tone to the, to the ones I just read you. It's called Small Difficulties. Is there any difference between what I'm thinking and the falling snow? The snow is covering what I'll soon forget. The dry wheat fields, the pale leaves scattered everywhere like small mistakes, and the red house on the hill where the neighbors sleep too soundly like lovers who haven't yet considered each other's faults. To the snow, my footprints are small difficulties to be taken care of later. My breath and the cold air are a contradiction of terms, and these words are like bird cries that clutter the air for a moment, then die. If it's true that I exist in the shadow of my doubts that have appeared like bad weather out of nowhere, then this would explain why I feel like timber about to be cut down. It would explain why there's something not quite right about the ice on the pond, which seems to give off a feeling of good intentions, even though it is dangerously thin. And it would explain why the light of the moon outwits me when it fails to enter my bedroom window on the nights I wake from sleep and need to know exactly where I am. It would also explain why tomorrow, as it comes closer, seems to have the look of having already been lived in. And yet the sun still bothers to rise and set over the dark barns and fields of disinterested cattle as if to reassure them that they're still there. So perhaps it's true that not all is lost. The snow as it falls is repeating itself. Over and over, it repeats what it is. Somewhere I read a quote that said, at the end of the world, even the dead shall die. And if you think about that, what that means is the, what the afterlife is really is the memory, your, the memory of you, which is contained in those who are still alive. And at the end of the world, when that memory dies, the afterlife dies. And so the poem is kind of revolving around that idea and that quote. It's called Why, Why the Rain is Ignored. The rain on the roof doesn't understand how complicated our memories are, how we can choose to remember a hot day in Moscow and the faces of two peasants quarreling over a horse, but not the room of a hotel we spent an entire winter in, nervous or drunk. Maybe we don't want to remember the day we saw two lovers quarreling. It was November, and the elm trees around them seemed unaware of the words flung like black coins into the snow. So we concentrate only on the flaw in the thin layer of ice on the pond behind them and try to forget that one of them hurried over the surface as the ice creaked with the sound of a pine tree about to fall. Once I stood in a spring fog after hearing the news of your disappearance, I can't recall exactly how I felt, but the jonquils on the lawn seemed uncomplicated as they tipped their heads in the sluggish gray air, and a few pink blossoms fell easily from the magnolias as if the trees were unafraid of their own nakedness. Maybe we're part of a long story to be told by someone who will purposely misinterpret what has happened so we shouldn't worry about the details of our lives, and it won't matter finally if we die in a yellow field feeling the distance grow between ourselves and the flowers, or in an empty street beneath the neon sign of a bar, in the silence just before someone touches the ivory keys of a piano. When we die, we do not reach conclusion. In the minds of others, the memories of us will be altered, or we will be ignored, like rain falling through the open windows of a house where no one lives. That's it for my comic poems. I'm moving on to the serious stuff now. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, this one is the interweaving of three memories that all have to do with the sense of loss. Uh, and it's called blood. We're living according to a deadline. That's the only explanation I can find for the crowd that surrounded the victim shot on the walk outside the restaurant where I worked as a waitress in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1970. Nervousness passed from face to face, as in the game telephone we used to play as children, where someone whispered us a secret and we passed it on until the last person in the circle said it and the secret changed. At some point in history, we must have received the original instructions for living 
but they're lost now. All the handwritten messages that explain what the years can't tell us have been torn to shreds. All of the explanations as to why the years wear out. His blood on the walk, and I remember now that a two-year-old leaned away from her mother and placed a finger in the red pool near the man's head as if she wanted to know how warm a dead man's blood is, has nothing to do with my life now, has nothing to do with the way my mind cannot hold its attention on what is directly in front of it. This fall, the red bud I am planting in the front yard and my own two-year-old who has taken the shovel from my hands and is trying to dig, his face turning suddenly serious and persistent as a gray sky. That day, I felt as though I had walked out of my childhood as out of a burning house and into my 20th year. I was afraid of the body on the walk, and I wanted to throw something heavy over it, a coat, but the little girl's mother did. All my past fears seemed insignificant. The time my father and I sailed out to a lighthouse in the Chesapeake Bay across rough water, and I was afraid of the spray which flew in my face and of my father's laughter, which sounded like nails shaken in someone's hands, or the memory of trying to piece together a blue and white china vase I threw in anger against the wall when I was five, and the sudden fear I felt when the idea struck me, as it struck me again at twenty and now, that the essential shapes of things can all be lost. I don't usually write occasional poems. By occasional poems, I mean, you know, those poems for an occasion. But when I turned 33, I loved the sound of the syllables, turning 33. So I tried to write a poem called Turning 33. By the time I got it almost done, I had turned 34. So I thought, well, I'll just continue it anyway. Then I turned 35, you know, and so forth. And we don't want to know how old I am now. But Finally, the poem ended up being called Poem Written After Finding My First Gray Hair. Uh, so this poem's taken a long time to write. That doesn't, ne it doesn't necessarily reflect on how good it is, though, because sometimes you can spend years on a poem that doesn't turn out right and very little time on a poem that does. But it, it has my son in it also who says a few things. Uh, some of these are quotes directly from his speech, things he has really said. I'll signify by going like this, where he talks. Poem written after finding my first gray hair. A horse gallops away ahead of its own dust. The sky wears black rags. Grass is flattened by hooves. The mouth is a hole. Why doesn't it hurt like a cut? My son says. We're lost. The calendars will find us. October 4th. The night swallows everything, even an ant crawling across the floor. The day he was born, it snowed, yet the snow melted so quickly that the streets stayed black. That's as far as my mind would go. I imagined a child, but I couldn't imagine him. Separate parts of his body moved, pressing against my ribs. He says, why is a table called table? Why is a chair called chair? Backing out of the driveway, one icy morning, on the way to his school, our car swerved, taking us across the neighbor's yard. I saw myself from a new perspective of apple trees about to be hit. My son and the birds watched me as I straightened the wheel. My first gray hair, the color of dust, kicked from a horse's hoof. This is a poem about an abortion. Child Invisible Fire. One day, the bread knife wasn't a bread knife anymore, and she held it to my throat. She wasn't a child anymore, and I hadn't aborted her. She passed unseen through the wall of the house and stood at the end of the bed. The muscles in my throat twitched, and I turned over. I don't know where she is now, I know that, but I would like to remove the small splinters, bandage the small cuts, stop her confused blood from flowing every which way. I hate these days playing themselves out like piano scales and the red buds exercising their right to bloom. Someone sensible should put a stop to this. A long winter should be called for. The word love is abstract, 
less real than the slippery oil on the roads. I walk down the road to our old house and think we could have lived there. We could have blessed the moths that invaded the house each year. We could have sat in the cool shade of the oak and talked. But talk is abstract, unsafe, a shore that deserts us. What was it you said as we crossed the lake one day in the rickety boat? You wanted a fire to burn the trees on the other side. You wanted approval. You wanted vocabulary to be simple, like a child. But a child has a head and shoulders. Now, as I enter the house, the feeling begins. I am observed by the chairs and the white walls. The continuous dreaming done by the narrow windows has nothing to do with the view. And outside, the empty street slides into place. It's only oblivion. The next two are, are about relationships also. What the sun invents. This morning the sun as it rises invents a few yards trees and you again at the back door coming home late until finally I am there surrounded again by clocks and dull knives in the kitchen, where first I hear the strange weeping, then watch my hand cover the sound flying out of my mouth. Looking back, I think that if I could reduce the moments of your leaving to only one, to the moment, say, between a glass being thrown and the sound of its shatter in the corner, I could begin to see why certain houses must be abandoned. The floorboards creak, dust collects on the window sills, Dishes pile up, and shirts scatter across the floor. Anyone living here would want to move out into the open air to escape the gnats circling the lamp, the rattling water pipes, and the light that resists entering this house, even when I open the curtains. No one would want to lie down at night in a moonless bedroom where sometimes I hear myself speaking in a hushed voice as if out of respect for the gauzy black shadows draped on the tables and chairs. This morning, I don't know why I am this particular woman who wakes, sleeps, and sips coffee in the brick house at the end of the road, or why each day the sun, as it rises, invents this house, the coffee, the sturdy table, the wicker chair, my own body, and outside, the front walk, which swerves left, as if it were searching for the quickest way out of my life. In this one, called the gaze, the, the female in the relationship is, is addressing herself. It's called the gaze. Cracks in the street branch out in arbitrary directions, some pointing towards a lone dog's howl and others towards. Are you paying attention, though? Each drop of rain connects, yet doesn't connect, to the whole onrush of sound. I don't like the sound of that, he says, facing you. He looks at you too long. There's a point at which his gaze stops short of you, as if he's seen one too many things. Ash trees, for instance. Leaves are tossed by wind, a force other than his own. You imagine a roof flying apart, shingles turning up at random in strangers' backyards. Are you at fault, or is a fault a widening crack in the street? A muteness a blackness at the center of his thoughts pulls you in. Every time he exhales, it lets you go. You find yourself in a strange body, your own body, as it turns out. You want to begin again. You want to speak. But when you do, it's as if stones are thrown into ponds. The ripple effect is maddening, extremely so. The first words to reach his ears are wrong ones. Don't you think the trees block the view? What you meant to say was this. My mind is an axe that's already cut them down. The ice almost visibly refreezes in your drinks. Dust settles in the house as if nobody's crossed the threshold in years. Silence ties its knots tighter this time. Beyond the kitchen window, grass is scarce in places, and there's nothing a gray sky shouldn't say, nothing it should. The Ruins I'd bury my face in my hands, but somebody has to do it. Set the record straight. The combs were hers, the razors were his, and the naked wax doll with the head missing was mine. I'll step away from the ruins into the sunset. I'll take a match to the whole thing, 
I'll throw it away, the paper. In the old days, the sun was stronger, so full of ambition that it saw through pockets and blindfolds. No more. They've taken away birds. They've taken down rafters. I'm on display and the sun watches me. That's wrong. It's completely self-possessed. What if I've become one with the rubble? Do I matter less than splinters of glass? Do I matter less than spaces where doors used to be? A button I've lost turns up. It's here in the ashes, and so are my old gloves. Why do my hands cast shadows on broken white walls? A last bird cries, making a wild guess. Here, nothing is private. The dirt, camouflaged by scorched grass, shows through in spots like bare skin on a dead horse's hide. A few more leaves are absent today, and everyone knows it. Here's one more uh, poem. The only thing you need to, it's, it's written in fragments. Some of it takes place in California, Connecticut. Uh, and the only thing you know, need to know probably is that my, my father is a sculptor and a surgeon. Doors opening here and there. A broken rain spout. A dream, water rising up the stairs. Mother and I trapped in a small rectangular room, her bones turning to plaster when I touch them, a melon rotting on the kitchen sill, doors opening here and there into rooms where no one is permitted, mother pushing father away without the use of physical force. She looks at him as if from a height, the way one would look at stones on the ground from the point of view of a roof, all of this occurring over cups of coffee. A few clouds scattered like minor complaints. Mother's description of my brother's apartment, no chairs, cardboard nailed over the windows, and a wife who cries when he returns from work and watches TV without speaking. Her possible description of me, how one morning my son carried handfuls of ashes out of the dead fire and rubbed them into my hair as I slept, stretched out, hung over on the white couch. Open windows, the wind disturbing the stillness, of the lamps and portraits. The feeling of being lost among familiar objects, of being unrecognized by the striped wallpaper and dried flowers. My husband, in a closed room, listening to Paco Bell, in tears because his father, now dying, used to close himself in a room and listen to Paco Bell. A crack in the wall that never shows itself. My husband's father asleep in a chair in the blue living room in California, the wrong words that seem to see, seize him. How will you get there? The four-lane hospital? The calm white of the almond trees? The rain speaking in extinct syllables? Connecticut, what mother said to father about his change of career. I married a doctor, not a sculptor. Father was measuring the distance between my hairline and my chin for the bust. What father said to me on a ferry from Maine to Canada, your mother's friends play golf. I hate golf. Noticed the apparent closeness of a couple walking down the rainy street just beyond the neatly trimmed hedges. Then realized the rain was responsible. Not their emotions, but the rain causing them to huddle together beneath the black umbrella. No comfort in knowing the trees have flowered according to my belief that they would. A few blackbirds jarring the ear with insults. Okay, I'm just going to read two more, I think. Uh, these are a little lighter, okay? And the first one, when I turned 12, between the years of 12 and 13, I, I grew something like four or five inches, and I, I just changed it dramatically in one year period, and it was really upsetting because my feet were big and I just felt big. And uh, I had to go to dancing school, which is painful because my feet were big, and they had this thing called the Cinderella dance where all the girls would put their shoes in the middle of the room then the boys would get the shoes and go find a girl. Of course they went for the small shoes. So mine was always the last one, or one of the last, and it was embarrassing. 
this is sort of a takeoff on that. This is not a literal poem, but it's a takeoff on that sort of trauma that 12 year old girls go through. And it's called Dirty Stockings. And it's still in progress, kind of, but I thought I'd read it anyway, test it out. Dirty Stockings. The girl is 12, a wallflower at dancing school. Her mother was once a homecoming queen who modeled clothes for local department stores. The girl wants to be like her mother, a debutante who marries a lawyer. She wants to have children, live in the suburbs, and join the junior league. And yet, she's afraid of boys. They found out about her chest. It aches, and two hard lumps are beginning to show beneath her shirt. At home, the girl looks in the mirror and cries. Her skirts have shrunk and bony forearms show beyond the sleeves of her sweater. Already, she's taller than boys. She's taller than her mother. What if she outgrows her own father? That would be wrong. At dinner, she doesn't eat, afraid of her body. She must stay shorter than her father, who stares at her long legs. Also, tonight is dancing school. Her mother has wrapped a gift. The girl unties the bow and unfolds the pink paper. How can she wear stockings and high heels? Will she kiss to bend, she'll have to kiss her father goodbye while bending her knees beneath her dress. The girl goes to her room and thinks, what if she wears high heels and her father dies? That would be wrong. And yet, her father makes her go to dancing school. He makes her watch the couple slide across the ballroom floor as she sits alone, her organdy dress matching the blue wall. What if she refuses to go? As chandeliers glimmer like distant stars, and instructors announce it's time for the Cinderella dance as boys rush to the center of the room where girls have left their shoes and each boy finds the right girl and they hold hands looking perfect like brides and grooms on wedding cakes. She'll stay home dreaming of fathers. She'll click her heels until all fathers are gone and then she'll dance all night in her stocking feet. The last poem is very similar in tone. It's called Romance and it's another exaggeration. It's a a, the woman in the poem feels ugly, be, you know, way beyond the way she really looks. She feels uglier than she looks, and that feeling is what's creating the... This is in her imagination, basically. It's called romance. It's sort of disgusting also, I must warn you. Okay. This is the last poem. Okay. He leans against the lamppost, hoping to meet his lover, hoping to embrace her beneath the soft rings of light. He is longing for a romance, and now moths flutter around him as he combs his black mustache. Meanwhile, back at the house, his wife looks in the mirror. She's fat. Later, she irons skirts which seem enormous like living rooms. The fabric takes forever to fold. She's so fat that soon her skin will fall apart, seams will rip, and doctors will come with needles and thread to sew her together again. Reporters will interview the fat woman. When did you first notice the shrinking furniture? When did you first begin to float up to the ceiling? By the lamppost, the husband still waits. He longs to kiss a hairless upper lip and wants to run his hands up and down thighs without cellulite. His lover's skin will be smooth like glass. They'll make love on stone floors in back rooms of bars. They'll jog for miles without stopping for rest and together will eat only salads and raw fish. At home, the fat woman stuffs fistfuls of cake into her mouth. Grains of sugar fall to the floor and flies cling to her sticky fingers. She eats and cries, her fat tears flooding the house. She had wanted a husband who'd fix the roof and mow the lawn. Instead, she got weeds, scraggly grass, leaky tar over her head, and a husband who secretly called her hippo hips. <laughs> At night, she dreams of murder, of throwing a radio into his bath. Is this romance? Whatever happened to silent movies where bigger-than-life lovers kissed on the screen? She's sad. She's so sad that doctors will come to carry away buckets of tears. Reporters will say there's an ocean in her living room. Meanwhile, the husband's lover hasn't arrived. Engaged to someone else, she plucks her eyebrows, bleaches her hair, and dyes her fingernails red. The husband is mad. He'll go back to stretch marks and pink scars. He'll suffer. He'll knuckle thick lips and double chins. Disgust will be his revenge. But what if the fat woman says no? At home, she packs his bags and thinks, I'll kick him out. For the rest of his days, he'll praise fat while starving for love. Thank you.